This is Rumble with Michael Moore, and yes, I am Michael Moore. Welcome, everyone. Uh, Joining me here in just a few minutes on Rumble is the great journalist, internet poster, and podcaster, David Sirota. We're going to be discussing the very urgent 24 to 48 hours we're right in the middle of right now regarding the human infrastructure bill that seems to be falling apart. Uh, Here, the Biden bill in uh, Congress So we are hoping that there's either going to be a breakthrough on our side here or this thing's going to get blown up. And what was supposed to have been a massive New Deal-like piece of legislation to help the American people is just going to be smoke. I don't want that to happen. I know you don't either. So we're going to talk about that with David Sirota and what we can all do about it. First of all, also, I want to mention that we had an overwhelming response to my Sunday essay here on my Substack, called, uh, I titled it, Insurrectionist Envy. And wow, the response is, uh, thank you for the response. Uh, Many of you have uh, commented and you've emailed me lots of uh, new ideas. So I may write a follow-up to this piece uh, in the next week or so. We'll see what the other reactions are. But I do hope this starts a peaceful rebellion. You know, silence is not an option right now. We've needed this for so long. We've needed to rise up nonviolently, not like the January 6th people, but our voices, we are the majority. We, we have to be heard. So before we get going here and all the latest that's going on in, in Washington and talking to David Sirota, um, I want to welcome a new underwriter. Yes, we keep getting new underwriters. Jeez, I can't thank these people enough who have come on board to support my voice and to and to get this podcast out to, to millions, tens of millions of people. So Our new one today, our new underwriter, is called Public Goods. They call themselves the uh, one-stop shop for sustainable, high-quality products that are made from clean ingredients at an affordable price. And uh, I've I've looked through their catalog here online. They've they've got everything from coffee to toothpaste to shampoo, snacks, groceries, pet food. What they do is they ethically source and develop each of their products to be free of unhealthy ingredients, uh, harmful additives, and, you know, all the the stuff that we're constantly trying to get out of our our lives. The amount of time we have to spend in the grocery store or online or at the drugstore or whatever, trying to find products and things that uh, not only don't pollute the earth, but don't pollute us. They're committed to making their products healthy and safe for humans, animals, and the environment. So anyways, here, I've worked out uh, an awesome deal just for Rumble listeners with our new friends here at Public Goods. You will receive $15 off your first Public Goods order with no minimum purchase. Just whatever you buy, you get 15 bucks off. They are so confident that you're going to absolutely love their products and come back again and again that they're giving you this $15 in advance, essentially, to spend on your first purchase. So go to publicgoods.com slash rumble. Don't forget that part publicgoods.com slash rumble or use the code rumble, R-U-M-B-L-E, at checkout. Just use it there and you'll get the free $15. Uh, publicgoods.com slash rumble. Receive your $15 off your first order. And I also want to thank our original underwriter, Anchor. Okay, welcome back here, and thanks again to our underwriters. Well, here we go. For the past few months, we, all of us, uh, have been trying to be at least optimistic about the promise of the Biden administration and how we have an amazing opportunity to pass legislation that will greatly, greatly help the American people. You know what I'm talking about here, the bill that's up this week, hopefully, We've been hoping that most or all of this would pass. Major advances in healthcare, childcare, education, the climate catastrophe, all of this got compiled together into what we've been calling the human infrastructure bill. And the price tag that was recently put on it was uh, $3.5 trillion. 
And the great thing about this is that it was being fully paid for by taxes on the wealthy. But over the past couple of weeks, corporate America, their lobbyists, their mouthpieces in the mainstream media, and their paid puppets in the United States Senate, yes, we will name names, Joe Manchin and Kirsten Sinema, along with every single Republican, have been sucking the life out of this human infrastructure bill. And it's gotten to a point where some of the most impactful policies that would help people, you know, the ones that are really popular uh, politically, the ones that if you go by the polls, 60, 70, some of these 80% of our fellow Americans want these things in terms of the, whether it's the child tax credit, paid family leave, I mean, you could just go down the damn list. So all these things that the American people want have either now been eliminated or watered down. And the plans to tax the wealthy to fund all of this, that idea is on the chopping block now. Well, our good friend, the journalist, David Sirota, has been following the money behind the forces blocking this reconciliation bill, as it's called, blocking it from getting passed. And it's so incredible to each day read his, I don't know if you call it a blog or whatever, it's it's similar to my thing on Substack. Uh, David's is called The Daily Poster, and he really does do this daily. And I'm telling you, uh, many days, he does it more than once a day. It's such a good feeling knowing that we have such an intelligent watchdog for all the rest of us. He's, of course, covered this type of scenario before, back in 2009, when the Obama administration's response to the financial crisis ended up bailing out and propping up our corrupt banking and economic system and our, my local, local companies in Michigan, General Motors and Chrysler, propping them up while leaving most Americans, especially the people that got caught up and lied to and their homes taken from them, leaving them to fend for themselves. And David Dow has got a great new podcast about this moment in history that I'm talking about back in 2008, 2009. Uh, He's doing it for Audible, and it's called The Meltdown. Um, It has a lot of parallels to what's happening today, and I urge you to check it out. And he's also involved in an upcoming movie that I'll ask him about uh, here that sounds really exciting. Please, everybody, welcome to Rumble, Mr. David Sirota. David. Thank you. Thanks for having me. I'm I'm really honored to be here. As you know, I'm a I'm a big fan. You and I were reminiscing before that that I think the last time we were together was actually about 20 years ago when I was working for Bernie Sanders and you were doing I think for TV Nation you were trying to run a FICA tree against a Republican member of Congress for that yes uh, show. And for, yes that, well you know the premise of the piece was is that something like 90 95 percent of Congress that if you decide you're going to run for re-election, the vast majority, if not all of them, some years, they all get re-elected. It's there's very little back in, at least back in that day, there was very little turnover. And I find, I read this article that said something like 90% of Congress gets to keep their seat over and over and over again. In the Soviet Union at the time, they had only an 85% uh, return rate. <laughs> so it's like, how could we be worse than a, a, a country that has a one-party system? And of course, my point was, is that you can make the case that we have a one party system in this country with two heads, but they are both beholden to capitalism and to the rich who fund everything. So yes, we were running a ficus tree. Uh, Ficus tree, if you don't know what that is, it's that plant that sits in your dentist's office. And so we decided to run that and we got sort of kind of on the ballot in New Jersey against this congressman, uh, Freelingheisen, who was running for his 19th term or whatever. And uh you were a big help to us when we came. I think we were, we uh, we wanted Bernie to talk to the ficus and tell us, you know, what to do about this. Uh, but uh, thank you for that help. We appreciate it. My pleasure. Just years later. All right. So listen, let's really get to the the core of what's going on right now, because people who have uh, watched the news, read the papers here in the last uh, twenty four hours, are um, pretty upset at what seems like the Democrats. Uh, giving in. Of course, realizing that uh, the gun to their head, that both uh, 
Kirsten Cinnamon and uh, Joe Manchin have been holding. There isn't a whole lot we can do about this. Manchin's not up for re-election until 2024. So it's not like you can threaten him. Hey, we're going to run somebody against you next year. Well, there is no next year. This guy's around for, for quite a while. But, you know, the progressive position on this is to get both of these infrastructure bills passed, the one with the bri- bridges and the roads, and then the one that's going to help people. It's going to help single parents. It's going to help uh, people with kids. It's going to help old people. See, because we're not at that age yet, but I, to, I just found out through this process that Medicare does not cover glasses, hearing aids, or teeth, the dentist. When did we just when did we decide that teeth were not a part of the human body? <laughs> I, I don't I don't know. I mean, it's just like who in America believes that old people shouldn't be able to chew? <laughs> they can't. They're, that, they're not. They're not allowed to hear, to see, or to chew. I think there's. I think it's a human rights issue <laughs> that all people should be able to chew. But man, tell us where we're at here today because it seems like Biden and some of the Democrats have been kind of trying to let us down. Uh, killing us softly with their song that uh, we're not going to get hardly anything of what we've been hoping to get from this bill. And the rich are certainly not going to have to, there's not going to be a billionaire tax and and, and none of this stuff. So let's talk short term before we go to long term. But in the short term, people are already depressed enough and uh, to think that they've that this isn't going to happen in these next uh, few days is um, very disconcerting. I turn it over to you, David. Yeah. Well, let, let, let's start from from the beginning of this process. I mean, this process started at it was it was going to be a six trillion dollar bill. That was right. Bernie's position, and Bernie made the right point. He said, you know, it really should be if we're being serious about this, it really should be ten trillion dollars, uh, but it's going to be six trillion dollars. And let's be clear, ten trillion dollars is only a little bit more than we are slated to spend on the officially non-war regular Pentagon budget in the same time period. So when people hear right. these numbers, I just throw that out there as a comparison. So we started yeah. at 6 trillion. Joe Manchin said he could accept 4 trillion. Then the bill went down to 3 and a half trillion. Uh, then uh, Biden and Manchin started making noise. We have to do a strategic pause. Then Biden came in and said, well, we're going to do 1.9 trillion. Then Manchin said, I couldn't, I can't do anything more than one and a half trillion. And I've made the joke that, you know, we're, we're, we're headed towards that scene in planes, trains, and automobiles where it's John Candy saying, how about two bucks and a used Casio? That the problem here is that the, the longer the bill has been delayed, the more it has been cut and, and gutted. And the Democrats have refused to force a vote. I mean, one tactic you could do is say, look, here's a good enough bill, three and a half trillion. Everybody, the House and Senate have, have voted on a three and a half trillion dollar framework. We're going to put a good bill on the floor, uh, make Cinema Mansion and the whole Congress start voting on this, and let's make them put up or shut up. Because right now, they're getting the best of the worlds that they want to get, they and their donors. They get to sit there sniping about this bill, different pieces of this bill that offend different parts of their donor constituents, the oil and gas industry, the pharmaceutical industry, billionaires. They've been sitting there sniping at different parts of these bills. And then that prompts Democrats to go back to the drawing board and start cutting away these pieces of the bill. So what we've seen in the last few weeks is you know, Democrats uh, have said they're considering getting rid of the most popular part of the bill, according to polls. I mean, this is mind blowing. There was a Politico story that said uh, Democrats, in order to get a deal, are now considering getting rid of the provision to let Medicare negotiate lower prescription drug prices. Uh, this, at the same time, a polls have shown that that is, if you ask people, what is the most popular thing? What's the thing you most want in this bill that you've heard about? That's the number one thing. So the mind-blowing thing is you've got a situation where the debate is in order for Democrats to get a deal with their own party, they apparently have to get rid of the thing that the American people most want. So what does that say about our system? And then you go through the the rest of it. You know, today, just as before we started talking, there's an announcement that the Senate Democrats are going to get rid of paid family and medical leave. Yeah, I just uh, saw that. Oh, the, 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 I mean, the, we're, ta- and we're talking about wildly popular programs. They're apparently, uh, Joe Manchin has said he wants to potentially get rid of the uh, Bernie Sanders provision to expand Medicare to cover uh, dental, hearing aids, uh, and, and, um, and eyesight. Uh, so 
the the big question is what is left in this bill? And I, and I should mention, of course, Manchin last week. Uh, got the White House to start getting rid of the major uh, climate provision in the bill, which was a, a program to not even force, but at least incentivize utilities to start using uh, cleaner uh, forms of energy. So the big question is, what is left here? And I, I'm not sure we know the answer to that yet, but I can tell you a couple things. The first thing I can tell you is, is that the fact that the Democratic Party leadership has not forced a vote on a good bill tells you a lot about how much they're really trying to pass a good bill. I'm paraphrasing here, but there was that famous quote from Paul Wellstone, who basically said, uh, if we say we're for something, but we're not willing to fight for, for that thing, are we really actually for that thing? And that raises that big question that how much if, 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 if they're not willing to go to force a vote, if they're not willing to put really any real pressure on cinema or mansion, then are they really serious about passing this bill? And I said recently, one of the reasons the Democratic Party always sounds so co incoherent is because the party is constantly trying to serve its corporate donors and tell voters it is helping solve their problems created by their corporate donors. So if you try to do both things at the same time, you sound incoherent. And if you side with the corporate donors, then you're not going to deliver on your campaign promises. So that's one, one part of this. The other part I would just say is the fact that the progressives, God love them. I mean, they held out to try to keep the infrastructure bill, the, the lobbyist written infrastructure bill with the human infrastructure bill. They, they, they vote, they took a stand on that. But the problem has always been that they have not drawn lines in the sand. They have said, we want the hard infrastructure bill to stay connected to the to a human infrastructure bill, the reconciliation bill. And we want that reconciliation bill to be, quote, robust. But the problem with a word like robust is that that's fungible. That's, you know, you can, you can fudge that. And so it's not really clear what, you've got Manchin making clear what all of his red lines are, but you don't have progressives saying we can or cannot vote for this unless it has these non-negotiable things in it. And so you've got a situation where Biden is clearly saying, look, I'm going to have the progressives votes no matter what I do. If I wave around a piece of paper and it's got two bucks and a Casio on it, I'll have their votes. And I got to mostly deal with Manchin to keep any kind of vote, uh, any kind of bill alive. David. <laughs> What is wrong with us? I mean, I, I mean, I'm seriously. Why, why haven't we figured? I mean, I, I'm, I'm sort of on some level. I'm just tired of blaming these centrist Democrats. I want to ask. I want to look inward to myself and say, what am I and others? What are we not doing to make it abundantly clear that we represent the majority, the majority of all Americans? That's us. The positions that we take, the things that are in this bill, this, this $3.5 trillion bill, these are all things the American people want. And why can't we deliver? Because I certainly, I, mean, I, I said this to a guest on the show last week, if, uh, if, if we don't deliver, do, does anybody, is anybody thinking about next year's elections? Because I'll tell you, it'll depress the vote. People are going to stay home or they may vote, but they're not going to bring five people with them to the polls. Well, this is a really important point. The linkage between the economic policies and the crisis of democracy that Bernie Sanders has, has tried to articulate. He's basically said that he's worried uh, that if the Democrats do not deliver real help to people, uh, people uh, will lose faith in democracy. And I think that that has not been really either well understood or accepted. Uh, and, and, and the connection is this, if you keep getting elected, promising to deliver help to people and people keep using the, dem the democratic process to vote you into office, and then when you get into power, you take the side of your corporate donors and don't deliver on your campaign promises. What you are doing is not only saying we're not going to deliver help to millions of people who need it. You're not only going to do something economically immoral, but you are sending a meta message that democracy doesn't really matter or doesn't at minimum doesn't 
really work. So then when you go to, into the election and you don't have much to argue for on the economics, so, you know, I, we haven't really passed very much to say to people, hey, look, uh, has your life gotten better? Then you go to those folks and you say, listen, you got to elect us to prevent uh, the insurrectionists and the people who are trying to crush democracy. You got to at least pr- elect us to stop them. There's going to be a lot of voters that look, I just voted for you. I just used the democratic process to put you in power and you didn't deliver much of anything. And now you're telling me that the main thing I got to do is protect the democratic process, which didn't do me much good. So these two crises are really linked together. You ask, what can we do? My answer to that is the oldest answer in the book is that the only thing that can be done is to try to use the democratic, small d democratic process to make these legislators do what needs to be done. That means really making them really uncomfortable. And that has not yet really been done. And, and I'm not blaming us as, as you know, the, the sort of, I'm blaming the people in power, but what I'm saying is, is that Joe Manchin clearly does not feel uncomfortable doing what he's doing. Uh, Kirsten Cinema does not feel uncomfortable doing what she's doing. Uh, right. All of these Democrats just, they don't feel a sense of urgency. Now, part of that is systematic or, or systemic that Joe Manchin may think, look, I'm going to go be a millionaire lobbyist after this. I don't care. I don't care about anything. Uh, Kirsten Sinema may be saying the same thing, uh, but there are, there are ways to run primaries against these people. There are ways to uh, protest them. There are ways uh, for the democratic, and this goes back to whether the democratic leadership itself is fighting. There are ways for those people to make them uncomfortable. I mean, one idea that I had that I wrote about was, look, you could t- take a good three and a half trillion dollar reconciliation bill, put a whole lot of stuff in it. I mean, a whole lot of stuff in it for West Virginia and Arizona. The president could go campaign in Arizona and West Virginia. Bernie Sanders is popular in West Virginia. Go to West Virginia, tout these big specific things in these states, then put the bill on the floor and make them try to vote against it. Now, look, maybe they will vote against it. But my point is, is that they have to be made to feel uncomfortable. And and just one last point on that. Bernie Sanders had an op-ed in West Virginia. uh, I think it was a week and a half ago. And and, and then Joe Manchin immediately freaked out. I mean, the op-ed was like a polite op-ed saying, we got to pass the reconciliation bill to help working people. Joe Manchin absolutely freaked out. Uh, how, how dare you uh, publish a, a newspaper article in my, in my state? And there was a lot of the elite punditry that said, aha, you see Bernie Sanders doing that. That was a big miscalculation. And I looked at it and I said, I said Joe Manchin freaking out is proof that it worked. Joe Manchin is freaking out over one op-ed. And by the way, the next day, Joe Manchin was talking about how he really wanted to get a deal. All of a sudden, his rhetoric had changed. And my point in that is that you've got a propaganda system, a corporate media propaganda system in Washington, which was a perfect example where power was challenged, power had to respond, power's response proved that the challenge actually worked, and the corporate media propaganda system tried to spin it not as, hey, look, Joe Manchin's actually a little bit nervous. They tried to spin it as, how dare Bernie Sanders do this? And my takeaway from that is that's the only way to actually try to get something done here. It goes back to the old idea. Power concedes nothing without a demand. That was true back then, back in the day when that was said, uh, and that is true today. And the demands just have not been uh, powerful enough to make these legislators uncomfortable enough. So in order to make them uncomfortable now, like right now, so that we can keep large parts of this bill, um, am I just up the wrong tree here? Is that is that now dead? Is that gone? Or no, is there I don't something, think it's gone yet. It, no. So what can we do? We the people, we the majority, what can we do right now to put whatever kind of pressure is needed to make this happen? I've really banged my head against the wall trying to come up with an answer for this because clearly uh, cinema and mansion uh, know they do have us backed up against that wall. And they can just say, sorry, Charlie, uh, we're going with the Republicans on this one. Well, look, first and foremost, there is no historical precedent, really, for one or two Democratic senators to kill the agenda, really the, the landmark agenda of their own party's president. Now, I'm not saying these aren't unprecedented times, but my point is, 
is that it is hard for me to imagine that if these two are really put on the spot and isolated, uh, that they would ultimately take down Joe Biden's entire agenda. Now, the problem is, is that the political situation is not allowing us to even get to, to, to use a metaphor, to get to the goal line, to get right there where there's a one big Senate vote and they're going to have to decide whether to take down their own party's president or not. To my mind, that has to be the strategic goal. How do we get the best possible bill in front of the U.S. Senate so that the, the obstructors have to make a really huge monumental decision? Because yes, Kirsten Sinema and Joe Manchin have behaved like monsters, and maybe they are monsters in their heart, but they don't want to be in that position. They, they do not want to be in that position. So the question is how to get to that, posi- th- that point. My view is one way to get to that point is to make sure that the House Progressive Caucus actually holds out. Because I also think, my, my, my other calculation is, is that Joe Biden is a deal mate. He's desperate for any kind of deal. He right. knows he needs to get a deal. Uh, and I, I do not think he has been properly motivated uh, and mobilized to mobilize that entire White House apparatus, which is a very powerful apparatus. I know there's this idea out here that the president's not powerful, has no power at all. That's a bunch of crap. Uh, we know that's a bunch of crap. Mm-hmm. And I don't think the White House has been mobilized to actually do what it takes to do to pass a real bill. But I think the way to mobilize them is that if there is a block of House progressives who say, we are not going to be for a bill unless it has X, Y, and Z in it, and we are holding out, and that is the end of it, that that mobilizes Biden to at least get a bill that that has those things in it onto the goal line at the Senate and and really make those members uh, those senators show their cards. And so my that's a long way of saying that one first and foremost pressure point is if you are represented by a progressive blue district blue state Democrat, it is to simply make clear to them whether on the phone whether on email, whether at their office, whether in protest, wherever you can, to make clear to them that you want them to hold out for, and you can come up with your priorities, a a good climate policy, a a Medicare expansion, a paid leave, whatever it is. Those progressive members still hold an enormous amount of power. By the way, so does Bernie Sanders, so does Elizabeth Warren. They too, they have as much power as Mansion and Cinema. Now, I was talking to a friend of mine recently that there's a fundamental asymmetry operating here. That progressives don't want to kill the whole bill, and in theory, Mansion and Cinema are okay killing the whole bill because their donors are okay killing the whole bill. So Mansion and Cinema can can terrorize the entire process in a way that progressives cannot obstruct the process, or at least feel they cannot obstruct the process. But I think we're a, still a far cry from a situation where the entire bill gets taken down. I, I, I think we need to demand that the members of Congress who are famous as progressives, who have large Twitter followings and are, are, are in the media all the time, that they this is their moment. And, and, and I want to be clear, I'm not saying that like to criticize them. I'm not saying I like you know, AOC. I, th- I think she's she's been great. I think the squad has been great. I mean, they're not perfect. They're politicians. I'm you know I don't worship them. Th- they've been better than most, but this is their moment, mm-hmm. and and they have a huge amount of power. So, okay, that I believe in, in everything you just said. But as you pointed out just before we turned our microphones on here, uh, it was announced that the Democrats are taking paid family leave out of the bill. Paid right. family, the only country on earth without some form of paid family leave. And, you know, one thing I remember about Trump when he first, when he ran is weirdly enough, he came out in favor of paid family leave, mm-hmm. said his daughter convinced him uh, to mm-hmm. do this. What are we going to do when Trump is running for president in 2024 and he's running on a platform of those weak Democrats they couldn't even get paid family leave passed. I'll get it done. Oh, I'm I'm, cer- I'm certain he'll do that. And our that you mentioned our podcast series that we're we're putting out there is is about how that history may repeat itself. Without going into all the details, but but we know that after the financial crisis, the Democrats made all sorts of promises. They're going to get tough on Wall Street. They ended up getting into power. By the way, with almost sixty at certain points, sixty Senate votes. 
And they essentially delivered for Wall Street, barely delivered much of anything uh, in terms of relief to homeowners and the like. Right. Uh, that sowed all sorts of discontent and do- created the conditions for Donald Trump to pretend dishonestly that he was the solution. And it, it's this, it's like the same situation. You've got the power to actually deliver. If you don't deliver, you're creating the conditions for it could be Donald Trump himself or a Donald Trump clone to come along and say, I'm here to do the things that the Democrats refused to do. And it could be a worse form of Donald Trump. That is the nightmare scenario. And, and that is a very real scenario. And, and, and that is the scenario that should be on everybody's mind right now. Beyond the economic morality of something like paid family leave or any of the things we've been discussing. There's just the political necessity. What are you going to go to voters with if you just got elected promising wildly popular things and then in a high profile way, strip them out of your own bill? And and my question that's on my mind is like, where is Joe Biden? Like, Where is he? What is yeah. he doing? <laughs> well, we'll answer that. Where is he? I mean, I know he's having a meeting in Delaware with with Manchin and 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 Schumer, but it's almost a, a worse version of what happened on the Affordable Care Act. If everybody remembers, I know we, it's hard to remember 15 minutes ago, but on the Affordable Care Act, Barack Obama famously said, "I'm going to let Congress basically write the details of this bill," and mm-hmm. he had a kind of hands off. And the problem was that that the Senate Finance Committee. One of the problems was the run by Max Baucus, who was owned by the health insurance companies and the drug companies, and they ended up producing a bill that didn't have a public option. That basically was a giveaway to the health insurance companies. There were some, a few good things in it, but nothing that fundamentally changed the system. Arguably, it politically strengthened the for-profit, uh, uh, predatory healthcare system that we have. Uh, and he had a kind of hands-off approach, uh, Obama did. And and Biden, by by contrast, makes Obama look like a like an FDR micromanager. Biden's like gone. He's like not even he he's 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 not I don't think he's playing all that much of a role uh, at all. He's I mean he's certainly not out there putting any pressure on mansion and cinema. He's he's not using any tools of influence or pressure, mm-hmm. uh, at least in public that we know about. And the right. stuff from behind the scene, we're not hearing like, oh, he's really arm twisting them in his you know meetings in the in the Oval Office. I I I, I don't I don't know why that is. I'm not going to pretend to psychoanalyze him, other than to say, to me, it looks like a lack of desire, a lack of mm. of will. And this is a party that just allowed. One of its other most popular uh, uh, campaign promises, the $15 minimum wage, to be killed by, or or they wanted us to believe it was killed, by a parliamentarian. Basically, Mm -hmm. Senator Chuck Schumer's aid that he can fire and replace. I mean, the nerve of them to come out there and say, oh, we can't do the $15 minimum wage because of a parliamentarian. What's interesting about that is not just that they killed, killed the provision, it's that what do they think of voters that they think that they can go out there and say that and anybody believes that crap? Like, what must they, how stupid must they think voters are? They think they're stupid, that they're a bunch of dolts and that they could get any, any of this by them. And, you know, I've said for weeks, answering the question, you know, what is Biden doing to um, convince Manchin and Cinema? And I've been saying, what happened to the days when I was growing up when, you know, Lyndon Johnson, man, he would just haul them into the Oval Office, take them by the ear, by the collar, and go, just tell me the pork you want. What do well, you there's, need? And there's that what story. What do you need for your state? Yeah. There's that story about Medicare. Uh, we wrote about it at the Daily Poster, which is that at the when Medicare was, was nearing uh, the finish line, although they mm-hmm. didn't know it was the finish line at that point, it was essentially bottled up in a committee. And there were two Democrats uh, who were holding it up. Uh, and essentially, I mean, they were, uh, they were outspoken against Medicare. And Johnson flipped the two. And one of them said, they were, they were asked, I, I, think, I think the guy's name was Smathers from, from Florida, I think it was. They, they asked him, it was either him or, 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 or Russell Long. But they asked him, what, one of them, what, why did you flip your vote? You've, you've been outspoken about this. I, I flipped my vote because Lyndon asked me to. Now, to me, the way I read that is is that Lyndon Johnson basically 
uh, bullied, threatened, intimidated, cajoled, whatever word you want to use, he made it happen. And offered to send $10 million worth of aid to their state that they could then take the credit for. And the point is, is that the, the president has so much power. This I, I, I know there's this idea out there that, that's made fun of, the, the Green Lantern theory, the, the, the cynics call it. Oh, you know, people think the president's a Green Lantern, a superhero, can do whatever he wants. I don't think that. I don't think that. But I also don't think the president is powerless. I know the president is not right. powerless. And I think this idea, and what's crazy to me, what bothers me so much, is that there are rank and file voters who are addicted to cable TV news, MSNBC and the like, who, are, who, who have been taught to think like pundits rather than like citizens, mm, that have been taught great, to think, oh, point. well, Biden yeah. must not be able to do anything because I know those pundits on TV told me that, oh, he doesn't have much power. That, it, it's just a lot of nonsense. Like, the president was elected. It's the most powerful office in the land. He has not given it the good old college try. I think that's obvious. Right. And, 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 and to, 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 to go back to my theory for a second, yeah. my theory is, is that then you've got to mobilize the White House to use its power. And the way to mobilize the White House is for a group of House progressives to say, you need our votes. You're not getting our votes until these things are in the bill, which makes the president, makes the White House say, okay, look, I've been dealing with Manchin this whole time. He's been giving us orders. I'm trying to just appease him. Now I got to balance these two things. And now I actually have to use my power, all of these tools that I have to actually forge a deal. And I don't think that the progressives have sufficiently forced Biden to do that yet. I am holding out hope that they will. But to me, that is the last leverage point that we really have. Because, And I should add that at least those progressive members of Congress are willing to listen to people. And, and I think in their hearts, they understand that the argument is a good argument. Now, there's a much bigger difference between understanding a good argument, believing in an argument, and actually fighting for it, actually right. taking risks. And that's what we have to do. In the Progressive Caucus, there are, I think, close to 100 members, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, right. It's 435 total members in the House, and 100 of them belong to the Progressive Caucus. This is not the squad of four people. The, this is a lot of members of Congress. It seems to me that, that when we're done here uh, uh, recording this, I should be on the phone or sending emails to various Progressive members of, of Congress telling them, Stand your ground. Do not, do not give in on this. Correct. It's a historic moment. And I would say the other thing you have to say to them is make clear what your demands are. Make them clear. Stop allowing there to be, because you're saying stand your ground. They've said things like no climate, no deal, or we want a robust bill, but they haven't said we need X, Y, and Z to be in there. Bernie has come the closest by saying, we are not getting rid of, for instance, the Medicare expansion. And right. that that's a very specific, that's a, you're either doing it or you're not doing it kind of thing. Right. They need to make clear what are non-negotiables. Joe Manchin is throwing out a red line every five minutes. The progressives continue to not throw out real red lines. I mean, at this point, I, mean, I know what my red lines would be. Yeah, I was going to ask you, if you were, no, but if you were a member of Congress, uh, you just stated one of Bernie's, and he's also said it's unacceptable that there are corporations or billionaires that pay zero dollars in taxes. Right. That for Bernie, that's a red line. Yes, I, I I would say something on taxes. Whatever, there's plenty of plenty of policies around something on taxes that raises taxes, makes the wealthy pay their fair share. I would say the Medicare expansion. Uh, wildly popular. I would say Medicare negotiating lower prescription drug prices. And I would say one of the series, at least one of, I'm, so, I'm we're talking about bare minimum here, right? Yeah. At least one of the genuinely serious climate policies. For instance, that program we just talked about, about actually moving utilities to use cleaner sources of energy, the one that Manchin is most opposed to. To me, I, that's not all I want. But things like that should be red lines. They are wildly popular. They are wildly necessary, desperately needed things. And if the progressives, they're there to draw lines. That's why they're there, is to draw those lines. I mean, it goes back to the Lyndon Johnson quote uh, that, that, that 
that are that was reported where he said at one point he got frustrated. I think it was on the civil rights legislation, and he said he said something to the effect of they were saying, "Oh, we can't do this and can't do that," and he said, "No, I want to push for it." And he said, "He said what after at the end of the day, what is the presidency for?" He was asking a kind of rhetorical question. It, it raises the same question to these members of Congress, especially the progressives, like. If you're not there to stand your ground on crystal clear things right now, what are you there for? Like, what? Mm. just because it's a cool job? I mean, is it really that cool a job? Like, it doesn't seem like that cool a job to me. I mean, fine, maybe it's kind of cool. But this is why you're there. If you can't stand for children, <laughs> right? basic, real basic stuff to help parents who have kids to, to instead of a, a quarter of their income going to child care, to pay for child care. To have that be reduced to seven percent, I mean, you could you you would be really hard pressed to find people who are against that. And and why? What are they afraid of? Why won't they draw these red lines and say, "Damn it, we're not. This is it." Well, why can't the progressives make a line in the sand on like old people deserve to have teeth, or you know, people deserve to have paid paid family leave? It's not that they can't do it. The question is they haven't been either motivated properly or they are kind of psyched out. They're afraid that if they take a stand that they'll kill the whole bill. I just don't believe that that will happen. I, I do not believe that Joe Biden, ultimately, he may be nowhere and maybe not motivated, but he knows he needs a bill. He knows he needs something. That is the leverage that they have. When you bring up climate, I'm just, I'm just curious too, if the Democrats aren't going to stand up for what I consider to be such minimal things climate wise that are in this bill. Uh, you know, what's in this bill is not going to actually turn us back to get back to a time, you know, when we didn't have so many parts per million in the, in the atmosphere. But if they can't even go for that, the message to me, I think, and to other people would consider themselves environmentalists is that, wow, if the so-called liberal party of this country can't even fight for that. Can't make that happen. What? Where is? Where does planet Earth go? Right, and that that's where it gets really dark. I mean that that that's, that's where the, it gets dark. That's where it really gets dark. I mean that's the other thing. I mean I I also think by the way there's an analog to the Medicare stuff, which is to say this: if the Democrats control Congress and they can't pass any even one thing really serious on climate. Or, and the Democrats control Congress, and they can't even minimally expand Medicare. It's not just that that's a loss, a short-term loss. It's that what's being said is, is, that, is that a real climate policy is not possible. What's being said is that the idea of Medicare for all is never going to be possible. I don't, I don't like to talk in, in finalities like that, yeah. but it definitely sends that, if, that message that if you can't do even kind of a minimal set of things when you have power. What you're saying is, is that you're telling millions of voters that, that you're never going to like later on when you need to get even more serious, that that's just, that's just an impossibility. Right. So that's why this moment is so high stakes. It's not just the policies in front of us. It's what we're saying about what's possible for the long-term future. Well, I just want to scream here because you know, I want to say to the Democrats, you're in power. You do know that, right? <laughs> I don't you think know? they know that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's it's kind of like trying to convince somebody who's constantly putting themselves down. Oh, I'm not smart enough or, you know, I'm, I'm this or that. And you're like, I don't know where this is coming from, but you need to stop that because you're really smart and you're a good person, you know, and whatever it is. And, and it's like, I want to scream at the Democrats that. You, you have the White House, you have the House, and you have the Senate by one vote, thanks to the vice president. You can't make squat happen with that? What I mean, at that point, you know, when I was younger, I used to think, well, the, the solution to this is that we need, that's why we need a third party, that's why we need a Green Party, whatever. But now, now that I'm older, I don't have the energy to <laughs> start a, a new party. I, I... I've I've thought lately. You know what? Why don't we just take over the Democratic Party? It's already there. They already have a building on Capitol Hill. They've already got a logo. They've already got stationery printed. What, what do we? What do we have to do 
to just move out the ones who've got cobwebs uh, uh, up and down their bodies uh, and and cannot make a damn thing happen. What can we do to take over this this party and make it the party of the majority? Because that's what it is. We are the majority, David, you and I, who 10, 20 years ago might have been, you know, discussed as if we were out on some kind of limb, barely hanging onto a twig. Um, but we now the majority of Americans uh, are at a point where they get it. They, they, we don't have to, we don't have to convince anybody that no, $7 the, and the 25 cents has an been hour. Won. That's right. The war yes. of ideas has been won. Absolutely. We've won. We, we don't have to convince people that the government has no business with its hands on a woman's reproductive organs. We don't have to convince the majority, the vast majority of Americans agree with us on all these things. It's not like it's 51, 49. No, it's like 60, 40. It's 70, 30. In some of these issues, it's 80, 20. So we already have the American people with us. What is it? What is it that we could do to just say, fuck it. Let's just, let's just take this place over. Let's just, I'm not talking about January 6th storming the, the DNC headquarters, but I don't know how I can really talk to the people that I talk to, whether it's on this podcast or people come to see my movies or whatever with a straight face and just keep saying, yeah, you know, we could, we're going to make a better world here and we're going to, we're going to, we're going to help the people that are the have nots. And, and, and then we end up doing nothing really, ultimately nothing. Now there'll be a bone. Don't like you say, they won't throw everything out of this bill. There'll be a nice couple of nice bones that'll be, will feel good. But you know, poor people aren't stupid. Working people aren't stupid. Uh, they know, they know, especially how Democrats come and promise them one thing and then, and then deliver on maybe one tenth of that, and then call it, and then say we're your friends. But I think your point is is right that that changing the party is of utmost urgency. We have a situation. I've used this metaphor before. We have a situation where you have the Harlem Globetrotters of evil, the Republican Party, and the Harlem Globetrotters of evil are a huge, obviously a huge problem. But at least part of the problem is is that you. You keep putting on the floor to face the Harlem Globetrotters of evil. You keep putting on the floor the Washington generals Washington. <laughs> and, and, and the Washington, and, and, and it feels like a rigged game. Like it's already a pre yeah. a preordained outcome. And I, that's a little too cynical. I don't exactly think there's you know four people in a room twisting their mustaches and haha. We you know it's like WWF wrestling. It's already scripted. But I do think that when I think there's folks who may listen to this and say, oh, you know. Fixing the Democratic Party may be important, but it's not that important because the real problem is the Harlem Globetrotters of evil. And my point is that those two things work together, that the Harlem Globetrotters of evil are only able to keep dunking the basketball and winning the games because there hasn't been enough of a priority on making sure we're putting the NBA All-Star team on the floor instead of the Washington Generals. That is, that's why the project of, of improving the party and 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 making it more accountable to people is not some side project. It's part of the actual solution here. It's not some hobby. It's it's integral to fixing things. <sighs> I can't take it anymore. I'm serious. I'm not going to take it. I'm not. I'm not going to. Uh, I'm just not going to. I'm not going to lie down and take this. And I, and I don't from, think you should. I don't think you should. People and, and that say they're on my side. You're not on my side. Look, yeah. and I, I should tell you, I mean, just as a personal anecdote, uh, and I'm, I'm not saying this like heroic or anything, but I worked for Ned Lamont when he ran against Joe Lieberman in the primary. Yeah. Uh, my wife uh, ran in a primary uh, for state legislature here in Colorado, and she became the first uh, Democrat to challenge an incumbent uh, in a primary in this state and win in decades. And it was a brutal campaign. It was really difficult. It was really hard on our family. I'm really glad she did it. Uh, she's done some great things in the legislature, taking on the Democratic governor when it comes to taxes. We got a conservative Democratic governor here and the like. I won't bore you with that. But the point is, is that it's not to say, hey, look at us, look how, how great my wife did or how great our family did or whatever. It's only to say that 
some of my friends have said, you must be a glutton for punishment. You're running, you're working for Ned Lamont, underdog, you only work for underdog campaigns when you've worked on campaigns. Now you're doing a grassroots media organization. Now you're putting out a podcast series, you know, challenging the, the, the religion and deification of Barack Obama and what happened in the Obama years. And, and my point is, is like, we all got to pitch in. We all got to make hard choices if you're going to engage in politics. The easiest thing in the world is just say, you know, I'm going to vote blue and not think about things. Like everybody has to, reach at this point, really, really reach and do things that can be scary, can do things that really ask us to reach. And, and, and it's just to say that if not, not to be cheesy about it, but if not now, when, because there may not be a when that's what the scientists are telling us, at least when it comes to stuff like climate change. Yeah. I think everybody listening to this, if you could just pause or wait till we're done here, but, um, (laughs) Take a few moments and think about what it is you have to do. Each of us have to do that. Each of us has to, has to look into our soul and say, enough is enough. Uh, I, I reject, I reject the world that they've created for us and that they want to continue, uh, where the haves get richer and the have nots, um, have to suffer long. And can I add one thing to that? It's got, it, it, it has to also not be the reaction of I'm just disengaging. I'm just- No, no, I'm the just, opposite. It, it, exactly. Because I think one reaction to this is, you know what? They're all corrupt. Forget it. I'm no, not- no, that's exactly what they want you to say. Yes, that's, that's what exactly they want you to what say. they want you to do. Yes. And, and they want to demoralize you. Yes. They want to debilitate you. Uh, they want you to give up any semblance of hope. And, um, and that is, that's Christmas Day for them. That is, Santa has arrived when you and I, friends say, fuck it. That's it. I'm out. That's, that's the best music to their ears. Um, that is not what's going to happen here. Um, we are not done yet. And in fact, what we've done is we've shown that we have been able to, through all of us sticking, sticking to what we believe in over these decades of bringing the majority of Americans toward the left, toward our way and, 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 and showing them, how things could get a little bit better for them and maybe a whole lot better uh, for them. And they've said overwhelmingly uh, that, yes, that's the world I want to live in. We have won seven of the last eight presidential elections by the, with the popular vote. The vast majority of Americans agree with us, not them. And when I say them, I'm talking about the Republicans. They don't agree with the centrist Democrats, these corporatist Democrats. This is my friends. We hold the power. We just don't know it. It's in our hands. And so each of us now have to figure out what to do with it. Some of you should be running for office. Everybody listening to this is somewhere where even if you ran for precinct delegate, I think that I think you just need like in some states five signatures on a petition to get on the ballot to be a precinct delegate. You, we all have to do something, my friends, because this hasn't worked. And the rage that I'm in, I'm sorry if I'm yelling into the microphone here tonight. But the rage that I'm in listening to the Democrats give in on one thing after another because of these two corporatist Democrats, um, they, they, they need to know that they are going to have to rue the day that they did this, that they did this to us and to the majority of Americans. And I, I can't. I think there are reasons to be optimistic, though. I mean, I, 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 granted, I'm always, I'm, I'm an optimist caught in a, in no, a no, good. Brain. Let's hear it. Let's, but, let's hear, let's hear. I a mean, couple. one thing we can feel optimistic about is all of the labor unrest in the country. Absolutely. That workers on the job are doing the really, really hard thing of standing up to the boss. That to me is a, a hugely important, uh, uh, situ- uh thing that's happening yes, that's for, for thing. years. I think we've been, a lot of us have wanted, you know, how docile is this country to get the corporate boot in the, in the face over and over and over again. And there hasn't been much of a pushback. Whereas in other countries, that kind of thing, you, you oftentimes see labor pushback. So I think that the, the working class the, we do see a, 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 like an, an activation that is really really, I think, uh, encouraging. And now the question is, can that be brought into also the electoral political arena? And the, now the, the negative side of that is if it's not, and this is what our podcast series focuses on, this is what I, keeps me up at night, is that we know that if, if things continue to get worse in the political arena, 
that that really runs the risk, not of benefiting the left, but of really benefiting the hard right. Uh, we did a piece in Rolling Stone uh, today, uh, uh, Alex Gibney, the, uh, who helped me on the, on the podcast, the, the director. And basically, there was a couple of studies that came out. And I want to preface this by saying I'm not calling Trump a Nazi or his, his followers, you know, straight up Nazis, but that looked back on what happened in 1930s Germany and found that the specific places in Germany, the counties the, 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 of where, where the votes were happening in Weimar Germany, the places where austerity, budget cuts, not helping people enough, social security cuts back then, the places where those were most acute were the places that swung hardest in the vote to vote for the Nazis. And they also found that the places that had the highest level of desperation, high, high uh, mortality rates, self-inflicted mortality, you know, al alcoholism, suicide, those are the places that shifted uh, most supportive uh, to the Nazis. And we know that Donald Trump uh, had a uh, overperformed uh, by 10 points to, to, compared to prior Republican uh, nominees. He overperformed, particularly in places where the uh, mortality rate in the United States has been spiking. Uh, we know that, that austerity doesn't prompt people to say, hey, I want you know, more Bernie Sanders, is that austerity and pain often creates the conditions for a, a right-wing backlash. Uh, that uh, it, it creates the conditions for dishonest strong men to come in and say, I'm the, I'm, you know, as Trump said, I'm the solution or I'm the only one who can fix it. So the point is, is that there's a political necessity to this to prevent something worse from happening. I'm not saying we're going to become, you know, Nazi Germany, but I am saying history is screaming yes. at us to not allow yes. this to happen. Give me one more optimistic thing that you see going on. Well, I, I also think it's I'm optimistic that there is finally a space for even what we're talking about. I mean, I can I, you know I, I, I back in the Obama era, this kind of even this kind of topic was brought up. You'd get completely eye rolled. Rahm Emanuel, you remember the situation where Rahm Emanuel, then chief of staff of the White House, he when progressives a bunch of progressive groups said uh, he found out that they were going to air ads to pressure i think it was conservative democrats to support a minimal public option and he basically berated them with a slur it it only became a story because he had to apologize for using the slur but the point is is that back then even mentioning any of this you were called uh, an apostate uh, it, it was like blasphemy and i think now there is a space to actually uh, talk about this uh, without being made to feel like you're insane. Uh, I do think there are members of Congress uh, who are on the Democratic side who are not happy with the situation, who are receptive to what we're talking about, uh, in, and who are willing to stand up, uh, hopefully, or at least have, have thrown out the possibility that they're willing to stand up against their leadership, uh, against Biden. I don't know if they're going to continue standing up, but my point is, it's not enough. But that dynamic did not exist 10 years ago. It just did not exist. Yeah, it exists now. And yeah. that that is progress. Right. Hey, we're going to run out of time here. And I need you to tell us a little bit about the movie that's coming up here. Oh, sure. Uh, it's not a documentary. No. Uh, but uh, you are credited with the, uh, you get a story credit uh, on yes. this film. It's the next Adam McKay film. Everybody, we all know and love Adam McKay. And it is, well, why don't, I'll let you tell, uh, tell us about it, but I've already booked it in my uh, theater. We have a nonprofit uh, theater there in Traverse City, Michigan, and, and we'll be, uh, we'll be uh, showing it on our screen on December 10th. But just tell, tell the people listening to this, about because this just uh, it sounds like a, a great, great film. So I'm not supposed to talk very much about it. So this is a special. Don't tell the higher ups that. Yeah, I'm, but it's just I'm us this. and just everybody. Us, just everybody us. and everybody <laughs> promises to keep it quiet. <laughs> yeah. So uh, go ahead. There, there's a there's a trailer out about it, but I'm go, but basically no, go, go it's ahead. a story of. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Right. It's a fucking Adam McKay. He's he, he got a hold of our sensor button. Shh! Don't tell McKay. No. <laughs> no, go, no. Go ahead. Go uh, ahead. It's a story about uh, scientists discover that an asteroid is headed towards Earth. And they have to go, uh, they, they tell the government, they tell the president. Uh, and a, at a certain point, the president doesn't seem to be all that responsive to wanting to do much. And so they have to go on a media tour to try to convince the country and the government to care about a literal asteroid headed towards Earth to destroy the planet. And I'll say this about the, about the film, that a lot of people have taken it to be a climate metaphor. 
uh, they, they, oh, you know, it's like climate change, uh, uh, this existential problem that we know is happening and isn't being taken seriously. But, but some people think, oh, is that a, is that a pandemic movie? Like we know how to stop the pandemic and we haven't. And I actually think what it really is, is it is really a movie about asking the question, are we able to process and react constructively to basic, uh, undebatable, verifiable facts? Or have we created a propaganda system, uh, an entertainment system that can frivolize uh, literally anything and frivolize it in a way that serves the powers that be? That is really the question, I think, that at the base of actually everything is wow. can we process facts that we know are facts, they're indisputable, and can we process them in a way where we can, as a society, react rationally to them? Or have we so created a system that, that downplays and frivolizes facts that we can't, even really, we can't even really process things like a civilization should mm -hmm. process mm -hmm. those things? And I think people will, you're going to laugh at the, the movie's hilarious. It's really hilarious. You'll see, the, if you Google it, you'll see some of the clips that have leaked out. It's hilarious. But I also think that people are going to find it to be, uh, I think it's, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to prejudge, I have people prejudge it, but I, it is a deeply important movie that gets at some of the biggest questions mm. that we need to be wow. asking. Well, I can't wait. And it's called uh, Don't Look Up. That's right. right. Don't Look Up. Don't don't Look Up. And who and who's in it? Uh Leonardo DiCaprio, Jennifer Lawrence, Meryl yeah. Streep, Jonah Hill. I've heard, I heard uh, of most of them. Yes, yeah, it's the the cast is ridiculous. Wow, uh, that's Chandler, a great cast. Like, yeah, it's a, it's crazy. It's, it's an awesome cast. Yeah. Okay, so in December, uh, right? It comes out in the, at the holiday season. It's not going to be on Netflix. Uh, and yes, I was I helped develop the story and I co-produced it and 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 I really hope you know I mean the I'll I'll say one one last thing I'll say is that and I've told McKay this. The one question that I have on my mind is, can a movie about a dysfunctional uh, system, can it break through that system or will the system itself, is the system itself that it's, di the problems that it's diagnosing, will the system itself make it impossible even for the movie to get a fair hearing? I mean, can you get- Wow, that's a heavy focus? thought. It is. Right. Like you're shot, you're putting a mirror up to the system and saying, yeah. this is a problem and, uh, but- but you're diagnosing the very problems that could be used to essentially try to frivolize the movie itself. Right. Hmm. Wow. It's not that I haven't thought about this before, but I guess I, I here's my optimism. I have so much faith in our fellow Americans uh, that I know the most, most of them are not um, uh, people that want to sit it out, just stay on the couch. Uh, they care deeply about their country. They care about their kids they care about their elderly parents, and um, and I know I know just how desperate and depressed people have felt in the last, even just the last twenty four hours, hearing that possibly these very simple things that 70, 80 percent of the American people are are in favor of are maybe not going to happen, and that despair, as you know, David, it sinks people, it, it sinks them. And, and they just go down into the hole, into the hole. And, and then some people never climb out of that hole because they just give up. That is, that's our biggest enemy right now, bigger than Trump, bigger than anything else. It's, it's our own belief that we've just had the shit kicked out of us one too many times. And I just don't want to go up and get kicked again. But, you know, anything that has happened throughout history that has been worth it freedom, justice, um, it has never come. It has never come about by uh, apathy, inaction, or don't worry, I'll show up and vote. The big changes don't happen that way. And um, I've seen it throughout my lifetime, and I, I'm still going because I believe that we've done such good work bringing the majority of our fellow Americans with us on these issues. Now we have to cross the finish line with them. And, and, I, and I should add, I mean, I, I, I've, I, and I want to compliment you. I mean, you've been in the fight for a really, really long time. And I know I, I've been in the fight a really, really long time. And I'm sure you have days, if not months, where you, you've 
feel crappy. You feel like it's not worth it. You're wondering why, not wondering why you're doing it, but it mm -hmm. just feels right. super depressing. And I, yeah. I think that everybody feels that. Sure. Everybody who's listening feels that. And I, I, all I would say about that is, is that's a natural feeling to have. If you didn't have those feelings, you wouldn't be human. It's actually good to, that you have those feelings because it means you care. And I think ultimately you have to process those feelings by saying it is worth it. I mean, my religious tradition, I, there's a saying in my religious tradition, I'm Jewish. The, the saying is, and I'll, I'll, I'll butcher it here, but it's basically, you are not obligated to complete the work, but neither are you free to abandon it. And, mm. and I think of that quote right. every single day when I wake up on the good days, on the bad days. And I just think it's hardest to keep, to hold on to that sentiment when times are dark, but right. that is what we have to do. That, I mean, that's, I, I have children, I have a family, I have a community, I have a country that I love, and you just got to pick, get, get back up and just keep, right. keep doing it. On the darkest days, um, when I'm just like, <sighs> what's the point? The answer to that always is, I don't have a choice. Right. That's the point. The point is, I, I, I yes, I'd, I'd like to go just sit under a tree somewhere yeah. and write some poems, <laughs> but um, I don't have a choice. And I think, I think a lot of people listening to us right now feel the same way. And that's why they're not going to give up. And we live to fight another day. And, um, uh, you know, I've already got my calendar booked in 2024 uh, to spend a lot of time in West Virginia, uh, getting mansion removed <laughs> in a, in a, a good, good soul from West Virginia elected. Um, but in the meantime, in the meantime, uh, let's do what David suggested here. Let's uh, everybody, even if you've got a blue member of Congress and from blue state. They no, need that's, to I mean, those are the leverage points. Those, those are, the, those are you, important. The, the, yes. Don't say to yourself, oh my, I, I don't have a Republican. No, no, no. You need to call them tonight, tomorrow. You need to send them an email. You need to tell them that we are not tolerating any of this, of this, uh, retreat and surrender. And, and I'll give you the number again. I've given it to you many times before the Capitol Hill switchboard. Uh, there's a human that answers the phone. They will connect you to the office of your member. If you don't know your member, just give them the zip code. They'll connect you. 202-224-3121. 202-224-3121. It's right here on my podcast platform page. Uh, as a link to it, please, my friends, the next 24 to 48 hours, it's so important that our voices are heard. Um, uh, do not give in to despair. Um, do, do, know that we have the power. We just now have to use it. We, we are the majority. We and all the people who believe in the things that we believe in. This is the best time to be alive right now. It's, it's never really been like this in my lifetime. I'm, I'm so, sometimes I just feel, I don't know what the word is, giddy. <laughs> is that still a word? Giddy yeah. that my fellow Americans uh, are standing up. They're fighting back. They're unionizing. They're doing all these things. And we can't sit this out. Not one, not one inch of it. We can't sit it out. So please uh, do as David suggests. Um, and, um, and, and please, um, as we close here, just, um, uh, sign up for, uh, for David's, uh, podcast, uh, the meltdown. Right. And, um, and also, uh, the daily poster, the, the, I should say the more than daily poster. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's great. And, and, and every, I, you know, I'll tell Basil, you know, we're just talking about, you know, sometimes we're preparing for the podcast here and we're thinking, yeah, did you see what David wrote today? That is like such man, you know, so keep doing what you're doing and, um, and we'll all be there to, to see your movie, uh, in, De in December, uh, sounds like an incredible satire. Uh, don't look up and, um, uh, please come back again, uh, here on rumble. I'd, I'd really appreciate it. It's been Thank too you. long. We, we waited way too long to have you on. I'm sorry. It's taken this long. So, uh, thank you for coming on today. Thank you. And thank you for all of your work over so many years and for being a real, a real hero on all these issues. I'm, I'm sure. And I know it has not been, uh, an easy thing to, to be somebody who has been speaking out on these issues for as long as you have. So I, I really mean it. Thank you so much for all the work. Well, that's nice of you to say that, but you know, 
as long as there's two more episodes of American Crime Story impeachment uh, to watch. <laughs> You probably don't watch much TV. I'm, I'm, I do. I'm, I do not. No, yeah, I don't. Actually. Yeah, I'm watching way too much of it here during the pandemic. But man, there's been some great stuff, and there's been some great working class uh, stories uh, that have been on. There's uh, Jeff Daniels is in something right now on Showtime called American Rust, uh, that's set on the West Virginia Pennsylvania border, and um, and it's uh, another episode, another series called Made about a woman that kind of ends up with not much and has to clean people's homes and toilets and everything. It's powerful, powerful political drama. Uh, I encourage people to don't do what David does, actually uh, turn on some of these things. It'll, <laughs> it'll, it'll give you some hope because they're the stories that you're living and, they're the, and, and you've already figured out what needs to happen. And we all together, uh, we will make that happen. And Democrats who are listening, I'm talking about my representatives in Congress, we are watching and we are not happy. We are pretty pissed right now. And, and uh, you need to draw some of those red lines. And you need to make some of this happen because you're representing the majority of Americans right now. So act like it. All right. That's the end of my sermon. Uh, David, bless you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Thanks so much. All right. Be well. Everyone listening, be well. Uh, thank you to Basil Hamden, our executive uh, producer of this podcast. To Nick Quaz, our editor, to Donald Bornstein, the human Swiss Army Knife, to Harrison uh, Malkin, and uh, everybody else who works on this podcast. Thank you very much. And um, let's all do what we need to do right now. Take care. This is Michael Moore, and this is Rumble. Rumble.